Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mission Innovation Summit. Thank you for joining us today. I'm your host, Denise Carpio. I'm on the UT Dallas Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship team and a student in the Emerging Media and Communications MS degree program here on campus. Perhaps even more relevant in the context of today's event, I'm also a US Navy veteran and an entrepreneur. I am excited and honored to be part of today's programming. The Institute and the Blackstone Launchpad and Techstars Network are committed to providing inclusive programming that serves a diverse community of UT Dallas and our surrounding area. We are grateful for the partnership that Capital Factory and the Military and Veterans Center at UT Dallas provided to create today's Mission Innovation Summit. And we hope you are all inspired and better equipped to begin or expand your entrepreneurial journey after attending today's sessions. We have a great lineup of topics and speakers today, so let's get started. We're going to begin with welcoming remarks from Lisa Adams, Director of the Military and Veterans Center at UT Dallas. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Adams has been the director for the University of Texas at Dallas Military and Veterans Center since June 2014. Before transitioning to a career in higher education, she served in the U.S. Air Force. She was in the first generation of women to fly combat aircraft and the first woman to qualify as a B-52 aircraft commander, instructor, and evaluator pilot. Lisa is a member of the UT Dallas Blackstone Launchpad and Techstars Stewardship Council, serves as the Region 3 representative on the NASPA Veterans Knowledge Community Advisory Board, and is a member of the Veteran Higher Education Task Force for the George W. Bush Institute Military Service Initiative. Please welcome Lisa Adams. Welcome everyone to UT Dallas's first Innovation Summit that focuses on veterans and military entrepreneurship. I am grateful for the team at the UTD Institute for Innovation and Entrepreneurship for their efforts to bring today's event together. I have an incredible job at UTD serving as the director for the Military and Veterans Center, also called the MVC. The MVC is not just a space on campus, but it's a department that provides programs, resources, and supports for our students who have served in the military or who may be currently serving or who have a family member who has served. I'm proud of the support that UTD provides to our military connected community and honored to welcome you here today. The Military Veterans Center's support is comprehensive and demonstrates one way in which UTD is a veteran inclusive campus. We are student centric and have four goals that drive our efforts. First, the MVC fosters community among students during their transition to campus life. We have a space on campus that enables our students to study, work in groups, access computers and CAC readers, and relax with coffee, lots of coffee. Incoming undergraduate veterans are peered with peer advisors during their first semester on campus, similar to the sponsor program we've had in the military. We also have an active Student Veterans of America chapter that connects our students to each other for social engagement, professional development, and also community service. Second, we honor military service and recognize academic achievements. For example, next week we're having a drive-through where our graduating veterans and ROTC commissionees are receiving red, white, and blue cords to wear for graduation. We heartily promote academic success while also recognizing the unique experiences our students have had serving in the military. Our third goal is to connect students to the resources they need to be successful here at UTD and beyond. In a typical semester, we host vet working events that connect our students to companies that are hiring veterans. We have resource fairs with some community veteran service organizations. We also created two councils, a veteran advisory council with faculty and staff and a community advisory with corporate partners and community leaders who are invested in that transition from the military to campus life and meaningful civilian careers. The MVC's fourth and final goal is to inform and educate the campus community and prospective students. Today's summit is a great example of that effort. If you are thinking about your education and earning a degree or an advanced certificate, please reach out to the MVC so we can discuss your goals and get you pointed in the right direction. We're transparent about our work and I encourage you to visit our website, veterans.utdallas.edu, to see for yourself what we offer. 
For those of us who serve in the military or observe the military close up, we understand the importance of mission and the necessity of a commander's intent for making decisions and evaluating risk. In my role at UTD, I have observed students from every military branch, except for the Space Force, and they are excelling in completing their mission to get an education. So what then do we say about that mission for innovation? Our students with the entrepreneurial spirit have a belief in themselves, their product, their business, and a belief in their purpose. When confidence is high and passion is high, great things can be achieved. I do admire those who have vision and take risks, and I look forward to learning more from today's panelists. I'm also enthusiastic that today's event may equip you with the tools and stories that propel you towards your mission and goals. We're now gonna hear from our first speaker, and I am pleased to introduce Major General Rich Stotts, who is the Commanding General for the 75th Innovation Command, responsible for leveraging the civilian education, skills, experience, and certifications resident in the U.S. Army Reserve. As a two-star general command, the 75th is the senior military headquarters in the fourth largest city in the U.S., as well as in the surrounding region. General Stotts was commissioned at West Point and has served in various positions of increasing responsibility over the last 36 years. In his role as a citizen soldier, Dr. Stotts has served for over 25 years as a contributor at various think tanks in the DC area, culminating with a position as the director of a 100 million program supporting the Department of Defense. He holds a PhD from MIT in electrical engineering, as well as a master's in strategic studies from the Army War College. General Stotts has contributed to six books and dozens of articles ranging in topics from artificial intelligence and society building to game design and the theoretical value of information. He has produced commercials, music albums, and is an active public speaker. Please join me in welcoming Major General Rich Stotts. Hi, everybody. Thank you to UTD for uh, sponsoring me today to speak with you. Uh, and I get to talk about one of my favorite topics in the world, which is my Army family and the 75th Innovation Command. The, we really have three missions to help with innovation and leveraging civilian contributions potentially to innovation. One is what we call tech scouting. And we get a list of technology gaps from the Army Modernization Enterprise. And they say, hey, we really need something that has these characteristics, these shock characteristics, something that can survive in this kind of environment. And we're gonna use this material in some kind of a weapon system or a communication system. And then my soldiers go out and they look across academia and industry. And some of them are part of that uh, Dallas team that you guys are, are familiar with. And they will ask you about the research that you're doing in those areas and give you a chance to, to brief us on that. And then hopefully some people in that research and development community the second thing my folks do is they go out and they offer advice. So if you're interested in the defense enterprise, in the Army Modernization Enterprise, and you have just never had any experience with it before, and the link should be distributed uh, during this, it's gonna be in the comments. We sent that out yesterday. Just go ahead and get a hold of us and we'll set up a time for our folks to talk with you. We can talk to you about how you go about getting involved in the process of innovation with the Defense Department and the Army in particular. We can talk you through the language and what some of the requirements are. And we can talk about the various funding means that there are. And there are a lot of different funding vehicles available. When people think about defense acquisition, they think about these big programs and billions of dollars in 15 or 20 years. But the defense Really, the defense enterprise has multiple means. They've got the small business initiative. They've got something what they call Section 804 or non-traditional accessions to do rapid prototyping. There's also opportunities to work with the various labs and research organizations and become partners with them. The third thing that my folks can do is they can help you figure out if you've got an idea, who's the right audience? Who's the right audience in the Army Modernization Enterprise who may be interested in that particular product and help hook the two of you together. We ourselves are not a contracting organization, but uh, and I don't play one on TV either, but we do know people who do have money and who do have programs of record who are gonna be able to interface with you. 
If you are an academic, there's other things we can do for you as well. We can do colloquium and seminars. We can talk to you about real problems that the Army faces. And those go the gamut all the way from personnel concerns and how do you do recruiting and retention to how do you actually conduct operations in electronic warfare? How do you, how do you operate a network in a, uh, in a disrupted and destroyed environment and everything in between? We also have a, a number of PhDs in our staff over 7% of my personnel have a PhD in a hard science area, and they're glad to be readers or thesis advisors and all of those kinds of things. We also do hacking for defense. So really a, a broad spectrum of services, and we're here to help you. We're very interested. Uh, many of us, uh, by the time you get to my age, and I'm old, I confess that I'm old, uh, I have uh, kids who have gone through college already, but we're very, very interested in that next generation and helping you get on your feet. 93% of the people in our formation out of the whole Army Reserve, so not just the 75th, but the whole Army Reserve, 195,000, 93% of them are not only soldiers, but they have a civilian job. And again, we can so we can talk about almost any topic you want to in the civil sector. And again, as was pointed out earlier, and that includes civilian education, skills, experience, and certifications. And with that, I think I'm going to give you back about uh, five minutes of your life you never thought you'd have. So, uh, Denise, back over to you. Thank you again, UTD. I really appreciate the chance to talk with you today. And again, if you want to talk to the 75th and hear more about us and our mission or have us help guide you, please check out the link that was included in the comments. Thank you so much. Back to you, Denise. Thank you, General Stotts. Next, I'd like to introduce you to the Managing Director of Portfolio Operations at Blackstone, Jason Santamaria. He's going to share a little more information about veteran initiatives at Blackstone and introduce you to our next speakers. Jason Santamaria is a Managing Director in the Portfolio Operations Group. Jason is involved in identifying, advising, and supporting margin expansion opportunities through transactional and operational process improvement, complexity reduction, and value engineering in Blackstone's global portfolio company holdings. Before joining Blackstone in 2018, Jason held a number of senior leadership roles in large public and private companies. Early in his career, Jason served as an artillery officer in the United States Marine Corps and as a Fulbright Scholar in South America. Please welcome Jason Santamaria. Thank you, Denise. It's great to be back at UT Dallas. I had the opportunity to serve as a judge in the 2020 Big Idea Competition last fall, where we saw some great pitches from impressive startups such as Lazarus 3D, Skyven Technologies, and Vigilant Software. And I'm even more excited to be part of today's Mission Innovation Summit, given the dual theme of entrepreneurship and veteran advancement, both of which my firm at Blackstone and I proudly support. Uh, a little bit of background, UT Dallas joined the Blackstone Launchpad Network in 2016 and has served over 25,000 students. And in August of 2020, the UT system was awarded $5 million to expand the Launchpad to six more Texas universities. So as a proud alumnus of the University of Texas at Austin, I wanna thank you all for blazing the trail for the rest of the UT system. And on the veterans front, Blackstone and the companies in which it invests has hired over 90,000 veterans, spouses and caregivers since 2015 with a goal to reach 100,000 by the end of this year, something we're very proud of. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker, General Dave Goldfein. General Goldfein retired from the U.S. Air Force in October 2020 after a distinguished 37-year career, where he commanded at every level and finished as the 21st Chief of Staff, the, ser the service's highest-ranking four-star officer. As Chief of Staff, General Goldfein was responsible for over 693,000 men and women serving around the world managing an annual operating budget of over $168 billion and the readiness of all U.S. air and space power. Over the course of his career, General Goldfein held a wide range of command, operational, and joint staff assignments and served as a senior military advisor to the President, National Security Council, and Secretary of Defense. 
General Goldfein is a senior fellow at the Johns Hopkins Applied Research Laboratory, senior mentor for new general and flag officers at the National Defense University, and serves on the board of the Air Force Association. General Goldfein was recently appointed as senior advisor to Blackstone, where his preferred call sign is now Dave. In addition to advising the firm's strategic and investment decisions, Dave will support Blackstone's commitment to advancing the employment and professional development of the veterans and military families within the firm, across our portfolio, and through our nonprofit partnerships. So without any further ado, please help me welcome General Dave Goldfein. Well, howdy, everybody. Uh, and uh, hey, thanks, Jason, for the introduction. Uh, Dave Goldfein here, and, uh, and really looking forward to, to to spend some time with everyone. And let me just to say first, especially for all the veterans who are uh, tuning in today, uh, let me just say thank you for uh, your years of service and what you've done for this country. And uh, I know for, you know, as chief of staff, former chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, I'm really proud to have served with you. You know, I got a chance to, to deal with a lot of uh, industry company CEOs when I was the chief of staff, as you might, mostly defense companies. Um, but, you know, and to be honest with you, I never, ever dealt with uh, private equity. And so when uh, when Blackstone reached out to me, uh, I had to do a lot of research on just what private equity is, what Blackstone is all about, and whether this was going to be a good fit, uh, both, you know, me to them and them to me. And the more I looked into it, uh, the more I liked and the more I really felt like this was going to be a, a great fit in order to to contribute in a different way to national security of the country, because I'm a believer that when it comes to military operations, we should never we should never send the military into action outside of an economic and and, and political framework. And that economic framework that we have to operate in is based on an un understanding of what it's going to cost to sustain operations globally. Because I do believe as, uh, as Americans, we have global responsibilities and require, that require us to be globally engaged. And you can't do that. We can't do what the world expects of us that, that needs from America if we don't have a sound economy to be able to, uh, to sustain operations. And so the more I looked into Blackstone, the more I found that it's an opportunity to contribute to the national wealth of this nation, to grow our economy. And if you look at empires of the past, I would offer to you that empires that have failed or crumbled uh, didn't do so militarily. They did so economically. And then once they started failing economically, then they had to pull in their militaries, they had to pull in their global operations. And whether you want to talk about the British Empire, the Roman Empire, any of the you know, Ottoman Empire, um, any of the, uh, they all failed economically first. And so what an important opportunity we've been given to be able to contribute to the national wealth and the, and the growth of our economy going forward. I wanted to offer you a couple stories uh, to share and then and then really open it up for uh, for any discussion that you all might like to have in the time we have remaining uh, where this the importance of two elements of what I think operation launchpad brings to the to the fight um, both of them where I was a young wing commander of a of a air base in Spangdalem Air Base in Germany and you know one of the one of the operations on our base that we were responsible for was we we did the central engine maintenance for all F16 engines for the entire region and that happened to be not only all of Europe but also all of Middle East operations so we had quite a number of engines that were coming through for maintenance and overhaul and my team came to me you know as the wing commander and I say boss uh, we'd like to shut down operations for a week and just take a good look do it a rapid improvement exercise a quality event and really just take a look at our operation and see if there's ways we can improve, see if ways we can innovate. And, you know, I, I asked him a couple of questions, one of them, which was, hey, so if, do you have a backup plan? I mean, have we have we uh, ensured we have enough engines built up to meet the demand because we can't impact operations? They said, oh, yes, sir, we've, we've got it all set and it won't, won't cost anything, but, you know, we'd like to give this a shot. So, you know, without a lot more thought, I said, yeah, 
knock yourself out, you know, you know, good luck. And quite frankly, I didn't, I didn't expect a lot to come out of it. I went by after about two days just to check in on them, see how things were going. And there wasn't a, there was a lot of, you know, yellow stickies, you know, stuck around on the wall, some, some, you know, scribbles on a whiteboard, but not a lot of energy in the room. And I walked away thinking, eh, okay, this one, this one's going nowhere. We'll be back to normal operations in the week. And then something amazing happened. One of the young airmen, I think he's about 20 years old. He asked a question. He said, Hey, he goes, I got a question. How come I got to lay on the floor, you know, holding a uh, flashlight in my mouth, you know, as, as I search for tools to work on these engines, I mean, it really, you know, bugs me. Isn't there a better way? So without asking for permission, he and a few buddy, a couple buddies that were there, they went over to the welding shop and they just started working on it and they welded a little trolley that they could lay on that had arms for flashlight tools, put nets to where they could organize all their tools, came back and uh, and they showed it to the rest of the team and they and everybody crowded around it. Uh, and then they started asking questions like, Hey, why, why do we have all our tools at the very back end of the shop? And we have to bring them, you know, check them out every day and go back. Hey, how how come we we line these engines up and you know sort of sporadically move them around? Why don't we put them like an assembly line? All right, so make, make a long story short, uh, by the end of the week, they had completely changed almost 80% of the operation. And as a result, cut 75% off the time required to put an engine through uh, overhaul. I mean, millions of dollars and thousands of man hours saved. And it all came from the question of a young airman, a 20 year old, you know, greatest treasure in our nation's arsenal who sparked the interest and then, and then took action. Second story. So at the same base, we had won an award uh, called the Installation Excellence Award. And, and in the Air Force, for those of you not familiar, it's one of the most coveted awards because it comes with money, million dollars, which may not seem like a lot in the grand scheme of things, but you know, I'll tell you, when you are uh, when you can spread it across the wing, um, and we had about 7,000 uh, folks in the organization, uh, it's amazing how far you can spread a million dollars. Vast majority was spent on self-help projects. And so all had somebody had to do was come to it, come, to, to with me an idea and we had money to place against it and we did all kinds of things across that wing and it was just fascinating for me to watch how a little bit of resources and some sweat equity just built the pride of the organization built morale people got excited about what they are uh, what they're you know uh what they were able to do um they they got even more excited because they were personally involved and invested in the outcome and I watched this transform the wing with just a relatively little bit of money. So fast forward now to uh, now I'm chief staff of the Air Force. And so from that, from those two experiences, I asked a, a question, hey, how do we how do we unleash the innovative engine of the United States Air Force? How do we unleash the brilliance of our young airmen? who have questions that they want to ask, but just don't think they're going to get a hearing. And how do we put money against their ideas? So we we built a fund. It grew to over $70 million that we pushed out to wing commanders and squadron commanders and, uh, and with very few strings attached and essentially said, look, you know, we, we totally trust you commanders to know what your challenges are where you need to spend money wisely and how you can get after the, the, the biggest readiness challenges and operational challenges you face. You know, don't, don't use this money to buy, you know, flat screen TVs and, and uh, you know, basketball hoops. Uh, I'm trusting that you'll be smart. First year was quite frankly, a little bit rough. Um, we learned a lot about color of money and what you can spend on and what you can't spend on. And a lot of, you know, some of the money did not get spent at all because we just ran out of time, quite frankly. And as you might imagine, some folks, uh, yeah, some folks came to me the second year and said, sir, we got better use of that money. Um, we, uh, you know, we got not put it where we can't spend it. I said, no, you don't, you don't understand. 
This is about putting our money where our mouth. This is a this is about establishing trust. This is about senior leadership of the Air Force saying we trust our our young people to know exactly what is needed to get the mission done and put put actual resources against it. So when a young airman has an idea, uh, we can jump on it. And so not only do we keep that fund alive for the next three years, but we actually added money every year. And the stories that uh, I, I love traveling as chief and then, you know, every wing would always love showing me what they spent the money on. I mean, there was one one wing in particular I remember um, that that took an old truck bed that they bought for, you know, a few bucks downtown and converted it, designed it completely and converted it into a standalone emergency operations center and uh, complete with four drones uh, screens inside, a generator for power. You know, the whole thing was completely self-contained. They could drive it to a to a uh, crisis site if they needed to. And they'd exercised it. Uh, and two weeks after they got it up and running, the largest flood in uh, Omaha hit and flooded one third of the base. Completely shut down their operations, caused significant damage and shut down power, uh, not only across the base, but also in the community. And where do you think they went to do the command and control and run the operation for the recovery uh, from that flood? It was this converted truck bed, which would never have happened had it not been for an idea that came from a young airman. Um, again, greatest treasure in our nation's arsenal and money available to act on that idea. And so what does this have to do with Blackstone and Launchpad? So if you think about it, that's what Launchpad does, right? A student walks in to a Blackstone Launchpad Center and they get a hearing. Their idea gets a hearing from somebody who can actually do something about it. And then if the idea has merit, that that student can also compete for resources that can help get them started. And together, you know, not every startup, we all know the stats, right? Not every startup is going to become Uber uh, or SpaceX, right? Um, but a few will. And if those few became, you know, big companies that hired lots of people and gave really good jobs and helped grow our economy, then we're we're actually executing what I see as a big part of Blackstone's mission, which is to create national wealth so that America can do what the world needs us to do as a global leader. So I'm really proud to be a senior advisor with Blackstone, proud of all the veterans out there and really proud of, of uh, Steve Schwarzman's initiative with Operation Launchpad and, uh, and excited about being an ambassador for the program you know, especially as a visiting professor here in the UT system. So thanks again to, uh, to Denise and to SJ and the entire team uh, for this. And uh, with that, I'll open it up for any questions anybody might have. Okay, I got a question from Victor. Can we share some insights on how to curate the DOD's problems so that universities and small companies can see and take a swing at solutions? Yeah, one of the ways that I, I can speak to how the Air Force and a little bit to how the Army uh, is doing it. I'll speak to the Army first. Uh, Army's you know, built a command, a new command called uh, Futures Command. It's based in Austin, Texas. And one of the ways that uh, it, it becomes a storefront, I think, for uh, for you know, small companies to be able to uh, to you know, compete for projects. I don't know as much about that program as I do about the Air Force, and I'll show you what we've done. We we began under the leadership of a guy named Will Roper, who used to be the head of acquisition. Just a brilliant, brilliant guy. We started uh, under him, and also a fellow Texan, former Vice Chief uh, Sevy Wilson, um, a program called AFWorks, uh, and AFWorks is a, also a storefront where. Where, and we have several uh, headquarters where um, during a pitch day, any small company can, you know, 
can come in with a pitch and get a contract on the on site. We got new. There was new legislation that allowed, you know, direct contracts uh, for small companies. And we we did one in New York. And I think the greatest quote I heard was it, it took less time to get a contract in the United States Air Force than it did to buy a beer in New York City. And and we're not talking small money either. We're talking you know several million dollars that uh, we carve out to be able to support small companies with with uh, intriguing solutions. A big part of your question though was was how do you have insight into into uh, what problems we're trying to solve? And I can tell you through the Air Force, uh, a lot of that is through our our AFWorks. That's the storefront. That's where you can come in and get a really good sense of where it is, uh, what it, where it is we're going. I would also encourage you to um, to to look at the service uh, web pages because I think we also we also uh, you know post some of the challenges that we're trying to solve there. And then, you know, last part of this answer, uh, Victor, is, you know, the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for the Department of Defense in the next several years is to switch from an analog system to a digital system where the, and the framework I've always thought about for industry is the answer to three questions. Does it connect? Does it share? And does it learn? Does what you're offering connect and does what we have connect not only across all the services, but equally important to all our allies and partners? Does it share information and data that's the which is the currency of future warfare? And uh, is that data pro proprietary and unshareable or is it open mission system and available? And the last one is learn. Have we placed artificial intelligence at the at the tactical edge where we're connecting computer to computer? And we'll get humans from being in the loop, which is where they are today, to on the loop where they're making critical decisions as opposed to working at human speeds. Um, boy, great question. Thank you. Question from Dave, what, what subjects am I teaching? So uh, because of COVID, I'm just starting. And, I, and by the way, I just retired last October. So I've signed up with UT, uh, UT uh, San Antonio and UT El Paso, where my good friend and former Secretary of the Air Force, uh, Dr. Heather Wilson, is the uh, university president. And the intent is for me to uh, teach uh, leadership and and perhaps also help in their business school as I get more steeped in the business of you know private equity as a senior advisor here at Blackstone. Um, but I haven't honestly started teaching yet. So we are now in the final discussion about you know, which specific courses and when we start, I think we're probably looking at, I actually head next week to El Paso for an orientation and I'll have a much better sense of uh, which classes I'll be working with uh, after that. Thanks, Dave. I will. I am now, uh, I just got a question. Will I be traveling between UT schools? Yes. And uh, hope to include in that uh, UT Dallas uh, is what we're talking about now. Um, so I, uh, you know, I stopped flying uh, actively in the Air Force in 2013 in Afghanistan. I stopped flying because, uh, you know, people asked me, boy, do you miss flying? And I said, well, I miss flying well. Um, and I stopped flying when I couldn't dedicate the time to actually fly well. Well, now I have time again. So I've rechecked out and I just became a part owner in a Cirrus SR-22T turbo, turbo uh, beautiful little airplane. And uh, it gives me an opportunity to, to quickly travel between schools uh, in a COVID uh, friendly envir environment. So I'm really looking forward to uh, getting out and doing a fair amount of travel between the schools. Of course, I live in San Antonio, so UTSA will be a drive. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you all are seeing these questions too, but just in case it says, what would it, well, I recommend to students who are just starting their entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, I'd say a couple things. Um, number one, build a network. Um, you know, most great ideas, um, when bounced off a brain trust will get far more refined and you will see the potholes before you start pitching it, um, in a very serious way, obviously looking for resources. So number one is, you know, build a Rolodex network, um, 
that's part of the launch pad program is it hooks you up to Techstar when you walk in the door and it becomes the storefront to building this incredible network. And, um, and once you have established that network and you're sort of bouncing your idea uh, off of your network, then the second I, I, I would say is really zero in on who you think would be a great sponsor for this idea. Who has credibility in this particular arena? So I've got, actually, I, I'm, I myself am working on an idea that I've been, uh, it's been brewing for a few years. You know, my biggest frustration as chief of staff of the Air Force when I traveled was um, the terrible lack of access to childcare, military childcare on bases, especially hitting our junior enlisted and especially hitting our dual military families and exacerbated by COVID. And the second area uh, that concerned me was um, the lack of friendly career paths for military spouses. You know, we often talk about employment for spouses, but employment is, is one thing, an actual career path that allows you to move up in an organization as you move is something I want to get after. And I've got an, I've got an idea that I'm working through and I've built a network and now I'm working sponsorship uh, to go forward to see if we can solve, to bring a, a public private uh, solution to what I think is a wicked hard problem, but essential to solve. Okay, from Kevin, how did AFWorks manage to break out of the yearly innovation cycle? The rest of the government is on and get to three cycles a year. Yeah, so, uh, you know, sometimes you ask for permission and sometimes you ask for forgiveness, Kevin. Um, we had the blessings of having just a brilliant uh, guy who understood from his background venture capitalism. He understood markets and he understood small business. And so when we set AFWorks up as a storefront, you know, the, 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 the legacy uh, sequential method of procuring hardware, which is the way the entire acquisition system in the Department of Defense is set up uh, still, is lethargic, right? Request for proposal, draft, request for proposals, proposals come in long competition, you know, and eventually you get to a solution and then you put something on contract and everybody knows that the IP has changed, the tech has changed, the, the adversary has changed, and yet we can't seem to break through and realize we got to work at the speed of relevance. And the speed of relevance is very often against potential adversaries. And so knowing that that was our big one of our biggest challenge, we were able to uh, break out of that by, and and by the way, Congress was very helpful because as we took them the problem, they they saw in some of our big programs the result of, and when I say sequential, you know, you don't get to this milestone unless you complete this milestone, which completes that milestone, and that's not a bad, uh, that's not a bad model, you know, for. Uh, for building something that you know will not need to change significantly for some period of years. But I question how many weapon systems fit into that category anymore. Not many, if any. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, can I shift, speak to the shifts in defense funding from terror threats to great power competition relative to early stage projects and companies? Yeah. Um, so the, let's go back to what I mentioned to you about this framework for digitizing the Department of Defense. Does it connect? Does it share? Does it learn? And if, if I added a fourth, I would add, and can it be trusted? Because the, the biggest challenge I always found to war game against was not having the screens all go blank because somebody attacked us, um, you know, and, and was able to hit our power source or whatever. You know, we, we actually know how to operate that way. I mean, we, we, we trained to that. The hardest part, the hardest challenge is when screens are still full 
you just no longer trust anything that you're looking at because you're not sure it's accurate. You're not sure if it's compromised. That's a wicked, hard problem to solve. So does it connect? Does it share? Does it learn? And can we trust it? And so as we shift funding, and now I'm, you know, this entire time, by the way, my call sign is Dave. Uh, I don't go by general and I certainly don't go by chief. There is a chief now who's a great guy, my successor. And I'm not trying to speak on behalf of those who are currently actively serving. So my perspective is uh, as a retiree, but what I hope and what I certainly champion during my time as chief is that we shift funds and 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 work with industry to make sure that they understand that um, if it doesn't connect to our teammates, to include allies and partners, if it doesn't share data uh, and data we can count on, and if it doesn't have artificial intelligence at the tactical edge, then it's no longer uh, oh, a, a weapon system that we're interested in putting money towards. And so if you want to be competitive with the Department of Defense, then it, it, it better do those things. Okay, let's see, Alex, uh, diversity, inclusion, you bet. Um, what kind of feedback do we get on those efforts? Do you think we supported innovation? Yeah, thanks, Alex. You know, I, I'd, I'd say the chief right and I sort of got a, got a conversation started. Um, and we probably teed, teed up the ball for the next team to come in and, and, and drive it down the fairway. Um, and of course, you know, I was looking at my four stars about, you know, the whole time I was chief, but, you know, most important legacy you ever leave as a senior leader is, is, uh, the folks you raised to replace you. And I identified General Brown as the leading candidate to be chief um, about two years out and started working with him. And Don was working with Shireen and, and, uh, and, and it, they are, the, he, he was, he was just the most articulate, the most thoughtful. And, uh, and now watching him in action has been, has been, a real blessing and fun to watch. And, and he's the perfect guy to now take this to the next level because what we all need to search for is greater understanding. And I think we start that understanding with the recognition that for everybody on this, you know, who's listening, who looks and sounds like me, um, I don't think I can tell you a single room I've walked into that wasn't filled with people who look just like me. Most of the systems that have that I've been in that were competitive were designed like by people like me for people like me. And so there are there are life experiences that I've never had. And so I've got blinders that uh, and, the, and the story that I always share to just visualize this where it was brought home to me. I was a young squadron commander and one of my chiefs, my, my chief uh, walked in, Jimmy Kelly, and he, he tossed a box on my desk. And he said, hey, sir, this ought to make you mad because it makes you, a lot of your airmen mad. And I said, uh, I said, well, okay, what are you talking about? He says, well, let me take you. He says, well, take a look. And I looked at the box and I said, chief, I don't get it. What, what, are, you, what are you trying to tell me? He said, uh, well, read the box, sir. I said, Johnson & Johnson, flesh-colored Band-Aids. I looked at it. I said, man, chief, I ain't getting it. What, what are you trying to tell me? So he pulled a Band-Aid out, ripped it off, put a pink Band-Aid on his African-American black skin and said, hmm, how to make you mad, sir, because it makes a lot of your airmen mad. And he winked and he walked out. So what was the moral of that story? What was he teaching me? I couldn't see it. I could have stared at that box for weeks. I couldn't see it. Hey, what, what other color should Band-Aids be, right? Every room I've walked in has been full of me. Of course, bandage should be pink. So if we start the conversation and try and that, and that search for understanding by, by a little self-reflection, each of us that says, hey, you know what? Um, I may not truly understand because 
I haven't had all of these life experiences. And therefore, there's things going on in my organization I just can't see. I have blinders. There's flesh-colored Band-Aids going on right now in my squadron. I just can't see them. And so, boy, if you start with that that humble self-reflection, then you start gaining better and better understanding, which, by the way, is a journey, not a destination. And perhaps you even take the next step, which is to build your teams with those who can fill in your gaps. Build your team for those who can see things that you can't see. And so I think, you know, the George Floyd murderer gave Chief Wright and then Chief Brown, uh, you know, an opportunity to start the conversation. But I, I, I think Chief Wright and I just really got it, got it started. Okay. Well, hey, uh, let me just end it up by just saying again, thanks, thanks to every one of you, especially you know, thanks, thanks to all the veterans, and thanks to the the launch pad, you know, bringing, you know, unleashing the brilliance of this nation is one of the most important things we do. You know, I lived in Italy uh, for a couple of assignments, and my Italian friends, um, they had a little saying. They'd say, you know, in America, you know, seems like you, you know, live to work. You know, in Italy, we we work to live, and I I remember thinking about that, you know. And there's a little truth to that. You know what? Um, we love to compete. It's in our culture. It's in our DNA. You know, we we love to jump in the ring and compete. We, we have you know, that entrepreneurial spirit in our bloodline. And so if Blackstone Launchpad can do just a little bit to unleash that, those ideas and give students who walk in uh, – a hearing and maybe some resources to get their idea moving, you know, God bless them. And I'm, uh, I, I for one am is very proud to be part of it. So thanks for your time today. Next, you all have a difficult decision to make. We just received notice that Dave Cass is unable to be here today for the customer acquisition session. So we're going to reschedule that one for another date. The other two sessions will be available live today. The hard part comes in the fact that you can only attend one live session at a time. Don't worry, though. Every session will be recorded, so you can watch the ones you couldn't catch this afternoon later on on our YouTube channel. Here's a preview of each one. At 2 p.m., you have three sessions to choose from. Veterans Founder Stories host a panel of veteran entrepreneurs sharing about how they started their business and advice for entrepreneurs starting out. Customer Acquisition will talk all about business development, acquiring customers, and retaining them. Innovating with a DoD will feature several defense innovation groups to discuss how you can engage with them and apply for grant opportunities. Then, at 2.50 p.m., choose from a session about getting started with Bunker Labs, Raising Capital featuring Capital Factory, and several defense innovation units and a panel that discuss distinct public, private, nonprofit, and entrepreneurial viewpoints to discuss current initiatives, future programs, and advice. All sessions have plenty of time for Q&A, so be sure to ask questions. Then, we will see you at the closing keynote at 3.40 p.m. Enjoy the breakout rooms.